it. Welcome everyone. Nice to see you here. To, and welcome to the high level presentation and interactive dialogue on artificial intelligence. What's next? My name is David Osimo. I'm director of research at the Lisbon Council and I will be your chair for today. Exactly two and a half years ago, the European Commission published the proposal for a regulation on rules for artificial intelligence. And after reaching the common position late in 2022, the Council and in early 2023, the European Parliament the Council, the Parliament and the European Commission have started the negotiation through these so-called dialogues. And the fourth dialogue will take place this week. And actually right now, as I'm speaking, a shadow session is taking place. So we are really still very much into negotiating definitions, risks, thresholds, exemptions. And two years and a half, in the digital realm are equivalent of a glacial era, especially for technology who has not reached maturity, who is evolving very fast, such as artificial intelligence. It's worth remembering that ChatGPT was launched less than a year ago. And at that time, foundation models, large language models, general purpose AI, generative AI, were almost unused terms, at least in policymaking circles. The reason for this long process is not because of laziness, it's not because of bureaucracy. Regulating AI is really difficult, and you policymakers have faced what I consider the steepest learning curve they ever encounter. We see disruptive innovation being launched on a daily basis, and policymakers are playing catch up with technology and even more with its deployment and large scale adoption. And we know that this is not going to stop here. One year from now, our understanding of AI could be as different from today's understanding as today's understanding is different from what we were thinking one year ago before ChatGPT appeared. So any regulation has to be designed not only to address what makes the headlines today, but what will shape the future in the years to come. And it's a very difficult process. And to help with this crucial and difficult process and to put the evolution of AI in perspective and shed some light into the future, we couldn't think of a better speaker than Benedict Evans, who is here with us today. Uh, Benedict is one of the most acute observers of technological change able to identify how technology are changing markets, economy and society. And he's been at the front of digital innovation for 20 years and never stops delivering fresh and original insight through his mass read newsletter, his essays, his presentation. In the rare case that you are actually interested in digital technology and you are not one of the 175,000 subscribers to his newsletter, please register. You won't find a better source of intelligence. But I'm actually sure everyone knows this already because you know we had such high level of attention and registration from decision makers for this session that it clearly show the interest. So it's going to work uh, with the Benedict will start off a 20 minutes presentation uh, and followed by the open, an open discussion. And to kick off the discussion, we are very lucky to have with us Gilles Babinet co-president of the Conseil National du Numérique and advisor on digital issues to President Macron. He's a serial entrepreneur since he was 22 years old, author of five books and professor at Science Po Paris. So you can imagine. And Gilles, it's an honor to have you with us too. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, thanks, David, for gathering this uh, incredible audience. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's going to be really, really interesting. And Thank you. Thank you. Just Thank you. A few words. I, I just had a, a lunch with um, a lot of people around this topic, and more than ever, I believe that we need to have those conversations. Wonderful. That's why we're here. And not only we will have uh, uh, two distinguished speakers, but everyone will be able to submit questions and comments through the chat, throughout the presentation. 
the session is on the record. The recording will be published on the Lisbon Council YouTube channel. So if you don't want your image to appear, just turn off your camera, although we very much prefer to see your faces. Without further ado, Ben, we are eager to listen to you. Um, thank you, David, um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I was sort of talking to somebody the other day about sort of the path of my career, and it occurred to me that in technology, the moment that you understand something is generally the moment that you should move on, because it's the moment that it's become boring and weren't boring. And you should always be kind of looking for questions that you don't understand, because that's where all the kind of the interesting things are. Um, and it struck me, there's a, there's a famous quote from Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher, who said that the whole problem with the world is that the fools and fanatics were always so sure and the wiser people are so full of doubts. Um, I'm not sure if I quite how far I count on a scale of wiser people, um, but I think one of the um, sort of key things to understand about generative machine learning, large language models, is, as, as David was saying, how new they are and how um, uncertain everybody in the industry is. Um, it feels a little as though everybody has spent the last year walking around kind of holding onto the top of their head with both hands going, holy fucking shit, this is amazing. What is it? And we're still kind of trying to work out at a lot of different levels, well, what actually is this technology? What does it do? Where is it going to go? And so I thought it would be kind of useful in that, let me sort of share my slide, um, in that context, just to start by zooming out a little bit. Um, there we are. Does that work? Okay, um, so I start by talking about new technologies and S-curves. This is a very kind of classic, well understood framework that new technologies tend to start not working. They tend to just start by developing slowly and people say they're a toy, they're stupid, they don't work, they're useless, no one would want that. The enterprise version tends to be it won't scale. Um, and the general question is, well, very clever, but why is this useful? And then it goes through a period when it's very exciting um, and maybe you should get a job in it or your children should get a job in it. And then it reaches a point where it's boring and it's just the way the world has always been. And I think that very obviously is now where smartphones are. 15 years ago, smartphones were amazing. Today, the new iPhone is amazing, but it's also boring. It's like, it's another smartphone. Um, it's, a, it's a pocket supercomputer that 5 billion people have and it's boring. And this is also, I think, where um, machine learning has gone in the last 10 years. So machine learning was sort of a stupid idea from the 1980s that had never worked. And then in sort of 2012, 2013, it starts working. And in the last decade or so, it's gone from an amazing, exciting idea to something that's now kind of well on the way to being sort of well understood and fully deployed. And there is a, um, an old joke in AI research that AI is anything that doesn't work yet. Um, because once it works, people say, well, that's not artificial intelligence, that's just software. That's just a database, that's just translation, that's just image recognition, that's not AI. And somehow AI is always a problem that hasn't been solved. And so if we go back to what the world looked like in 2013, which I think one could kind of call sort of version one of machine learning, which is when it starts working, <coughs> excuse me, there's an academic image, comp image recognition competition called ImageNet and machine learning starts working and it produces images like this. And I would go to big companies or civil servants and say so I would show them this and they would say very clever, well done. Why is this useful? What are we supposed to do with this? And you could show things like this. This was kind of an early image, re image recognition demo to show how difficult this problem actually was. Um, and it would work, but it wasn't clear why this was useful. And we kind of went in the last 10 years, we went through this process from, okay, image re recognition works to working out like what's the right level of abstraction to understand this. Um, that really this is pattern recognition. And then we have to work out, well, what is pattern recognition? What problems could you turn into pattern recognition that maybe didn't look like pattern rec recognition to begin with? And there are many things that did not look like recognizing cats or dogs that turned out to be image recognition problems. Um, we're now kind of going through that process again with a second wave of machine learning. I think it's a kind of a useful way of describing it. This is sort of another wave um, that people call uh, generative machine learning, sometimes people talk about large language models. Um, in general, I think when you talk about AI, it's useful to go one level back and be specific about what technology you're talking about. It's more useful to talk about machine learning or large language models than to say AI, because I sort of suggested earlier, AI could mean anything. And so again, we have these amazing demos. 
So here is Midjourney. Um, Midjourney can now, uh, AI can now make cat pictures. So I type that in, I get that out of Midjourney. I ask for a song about Tesla and SpaceX and I get a song about Tesla and SpaceX and it scans and rhymes. It's a song, this is amazing. I can also ask it to explain something or give me an itinerary. Or, you know, if I'm going to go to Barcelona next week, instead of having 20 tabs open in Google, I can just ask ChatGPT, what should I do? And so this gets people very excited about what this might do to the web or to search or to Google. I can ask it to make products. So the image on the bottom left here is a product shot from Shein, the other three images from Midjourney using the Shein product description. And, you know, that's not, those aren't quite ready to send to a factory yet, but this is clearly just now in, an engineering question, not a science fiction question. And then you can go a bit further and say, well, what if I could ask this to explain something? So there's an old engineering joke that a Russian screwdriver is a hammer. Um, you just hit it harder. And um, so you can ask ChatGPT, can you explain this, please? And it actually produces not a bad explanation of what this might be. Um, and so this has all been, in the last year, as we all know, very exciting. ChatGPT has apparently had 100 million users and a billion dollars of revenue. And um, McKinsey did this survey of um, their client base and found that basically everybody has tried this. Um, you know, certainly well over 75% of management in big companies have at least tried ChatGPT and you know, 10, 20% of people are using it um, every day. Um, so this is all very exciting. However, um, imagine you have invited Benedict Evans to speak at a conference. This is something that happened to me earlier this year and you want a nice long biography of them. And Benedict has only given you a short biography so you use ChatGPT and you get this. It says Benedict is prominent, important, hugely influential, which is all true. Um, went to Cambridge, worked at Anders Analysis, worked at Andreessen Horowitz. Yes, this is correct. Reload. Oops, now he went to LSE and worked at Financial Times and worked for ABI Research. Ah, uh, no, no, actually he did go to Cambridge, but he worked for The Guardian and then worked for Atlas Ventures. And so this is... This is this thing that OpenAI call hallucination. I don't think that's what it is. We also, people also call it bullshitting, or they say this is the overconfident undergraduate who will answer a question without knowing. I also don't think that's quite right. What's happening here is it's matching pattern. So it never says I went to Sciences Po or MIT. It never says I studied theology. It's always the right kind of job and the right kind of degree. And so this is something that somebody tried earlier this year. They asked, what's the most cited economics paper of all time? The answer is a paper that doesn't exist, but it looks like what a paper like that would look like. So what kinds of papers? Which authors? What kinds of, do they have co-authors? What kinds of subjects? What kinds of journals? So it has set, aren't, what is actually done is it said, what would the most cited economics paper look like? What kind of writer would have written it? What kind of journal would have published it? I think you can see this more clearly if you look at an image generator. So earlier this year, I asked Midjourney to make me an imaginary 1960s French sports car. So this is a very cool French sport. You know, it looks French. It looks like it's in a French house. That looks got a, It looks kind of Citroen. It's got like a 1960s coloring. It has two steering wheels and no door. And it's not lying. It knows that shapes like this have shapes like that in roughly that place. But it doesn't know what steering wheels are. It's just matching the pattern. Now, this can be very deceptive, and I think it's particularly deceptive when you're looking at text because the prose is perfect. And so you tend to have perfect prose, but the model behind the prose isn't perfect. And the same thing here, the optics and the perspective and the color and probably even the reflection are perfect, but it doesn't know what a car is. So you're sort of misled by the surface. Um, so this is a survey that Deloitte did in the summer. People who have used generative AI think it's accurate. So you have to kind of use it quite a lot and test it and press it to start understanding what it's doing. And as you do that, you realize that when you use these things, you're not actually saying answer this question. What you're actually doing is saying what sort of things are in the training data that might be look like answers to questions that look like your question. And so you get a lot of kind of puzzles of what this is. This is not a database. It's not Google. It's also not Napster. It's not a piracy system. There are lots of copyright content in the training data, but the copyright content is not in the model, and it cannot give you the copyright content back. A great framing that I saw recently was to say that large language models tend to be bad at things that computers are good at and good at things that computers are bad at. 
So they are good at making and writing songs, but they are very bad at giving you the same answer every time. The framing that I've always liked is to say that AI gives you infinite interns. And I used this about the last wave of AI. So you would like somebody to listen to every single call coming to the call center and tell me if the customer is angry or if your service agent is being rude. You don't need an expert to that for that. You could get a 15 year old to, to do that. In fact, you could probably get a dog to do that because dogs do have general intelligence, unlike large language models. Um, but you don't have enough interns. Well, AI lets you automate that. It lets you automate anything you could get a 10 year old to do. And the same thing kind of applies here. So if you go back to this biography, if they had emailed me and said, Benedict, we want a 700 word biography of yourself, I would have said, oh, fuck, I want to do that. That's going to take me hours. So instead, I could go to ChatGPT and say, write a 700 word biography of myself, and then I could fix it. So again, that would give me an intern. Or you can be in that agency and you say, give me 500 ideas for this, and I'll pick the 50 that I really like. Again, this is sort of automation of what you might get an intern to do for you. Now, if we shift back to how people are trying to think about this, there's a sort of a base level that says, OK, this is one of these every 10 or 15 year changes that come through the tech industry, like the iPhone, like the web, like open source or cloud, indeed, like the last wave of machine learning. For the next five or 10 years, every new company will be built around this and then there'll be something else. There's another level of excitement that says this is no, no, this is more like an every 20 or 30 year thing. So Bill Gates um, said this summer that when he went to Xerox Park in the 1970s and saw um, graphical user interfaces for the first time, he realized this was a step change in who could use computers because you wouldn't have to learn command lines to type into the computer. You could just click on what you wanted. However, somebody had to have made the things you're clicking on. Someone still had to have made the software that you were using with a mouse. And now, in theory, you can just go to ChatGPT and ask it to do something. You can go to an LLM and ask it to do something so you don't need hundreds of different tools. You maybe have many fewer tools all running with, within one piece of software. There is then, I would say, a third set of people, a much smaller group of people, who think that this will take us to what we call AGI, artificial general intelligence, a computer that is alive and intelligent and aware in the sense that people, or perhaps dogs or horses, are alive and aware. Um, that is a conversation I'll come back to in a minute. But meanwhile, since I've talked about platform shifts, we should kind of think about platform shifts. Um, as I said, every 10 or 15 years, the tech industry has gone through one of these shifts that resets what everything in the tech industry is built around. It was mainframes and then PCs and then the web and then smartphones. And as you go through these shifts, there's a common set of questions that repeat every time. So there are a lot of engineering questions about how are you going to build this? How is it going to work? How is it going to scale? There's a set of value capture questions about who will make all the money. And then there's a set of questions around, well, what will the actual product be as opposed to all of the concepts and demos? And those all, of course, feed off each other and, and reinforce each other. And so today with generative machine learning, we have a bunch of engineering questions. Most obviously, these models, the L in large language model is important. Um, this is the first time that it has actually cost real money every time a consumer presses OK in a consumer app. And so there is a gold rush to acquire um, the processing power to run this, to get the models to be smaller, to get the models to run faster. And NVIDIA at the moment is um, overwhelmed by demand for GPUs. There is also a whole set of questions around um, how many models there are going to be. Will we have sort of two or three Velt computers and everything else plugs onto that? Or will this look like every other wave of, of, of computer science? And it will maybe in 10 years time, there will be as many machine learning models as there are spreadsheets or databases. Um, and trying to regulate models will be absurd. We don't know. And then, of course, there's a question of what the product will look like. Because every time you get these new technologies, to begin with, you make it fit what you already do. And then over time, you change the way you work in order to fit your job. And we're now kind of going through that process as this technology gets absorbed into product. And so what always happens is that the incumbents always try to make it a feature. So now we see Google and Microsoft adding LLMs to every aspect of Google Sheets and Google Slides and Outlook and Gmail and so on. Then startups get created that try and unbundle some piece of the incumbent, some peel some business out into a new company. And every now and then, you fundamentally change the nature of the industry. So I think Uber is kind of an interesting as an example here. This is a um, this is a story that got a lot of attention now nine years ago. 
um, a finance professor in New York said um, Uber isn't worth very much money because, first of all, the global taxi market is $100 billion. Secondly, Uber will only get 10%. Therefore, it's not worth $17 billion. The reality, um, a decade later, was that Uber actually got $60 billion and the entire conception of what the addressable market was was wrong. That what Uber was not doing was taking a percentage of the taxi market. Uber was changing what the taxi market actually was. Um, and that's kind of the third step when you actually change what the market could be. Now, of course, Uber is, amongst other things, a regulation and a policy question. Um, and so I thought I would talk, given the audience, about policy. Now, this is, again, something I made in mid-journey um, with this prompt. So Cindy Sherman is a fine art photographer. I ask it to make me a picture in the style of Cindy Sherman. Now, if you go to an art gallery in Paris or London or New York and look and say, what do you think about this? They will shrug, like, that's not a problem. But there's a whole other category of kinds of artists and creators who get very upset by this. Um, if I go to um, Google today and say, tell me some news, Google will give me links to newspapers and I will click on them and I will give, go and give the newspapers some business. And the idea that Google should be paying the newspapers to send them business is, let me pick a nice scientific word, bullshit. The more academic term, I think, would be rent seeking, um, privileged rent seeking. Um, but if I can go to ChatGPT and say, explain this news story. So this is a story about the cancellation of a high speed rail project in the UK. I, and so I did this last week. I can go to ChatGPT and say, explain this story. And it goes and reads five news websites and explains it to me. Now, at this point, the complaint of a newspaper or indeed any publisher becomes very different. And already a huge number of publishers have started blocking ChatGPT. Now, to be clear, what's happening here is this isn't in the training data. What I've done is I've told Jack GPT today, go and look at the web and work out the answer and explain it to me. So it generated that the moment I asked the question. So this gets us um, very obviously a conversation about regulation. And I think one should probably start by saying, well, every big important industry tends to get regulated. Um, we regulated railways and food and aircraft and cars. And in the last couple of years, we've had an awful lot of effort to regulate the Internet or to regulate software. And now we talk a lot about AI. Um, and, you know, it's a sort of a, a basic problem that we have here is that you know, software became the world. Everyone is using software all the time. And so all the world's problems get expressed in software. And so we regulate it. But I said a moment ago, we regulate cars. That's not really true. We don't regulate cars. We regulate 10 or 15 or 20 different things. And the people who worry about um, collision safety or emissions or the way that General Motors treats its suppliers are different. And they are different from the people who ask, should Paris have cycle lanes or should Amsterdam be pedestrianized? Or what do we think about deploying charging points for EVs? These are all different questions. And most of those questions are complicated and most of them have trade-offs. Um, a nice illustration of this is was produced by an advocate for public transport. Um, this is not a competition problem. You can't go to General Motors or Ford and say you have to do this. You can't break up General Motors to make this happen. The competition, um, technology regulation, regulation is complicated. And so this is, um, meanwhile, of course, you have to ask, well, what does success look like? So this is a chart of um, annual deaths from car crashes in the USA. I should update this chart because it's gone up a little bit in the last year or two. Um, so you can look at this chart and say this is a complete failure of 50 years of car safety. You could also look at it in terms of death per passenger mile or per car, and you can see, oh, this has actually been hugely successful. And so you have to work out, well, what does success look like? In a world where we didn't grow up with this, um, we spent 100 years understanding how cars worked. We grew up with cars. We understand what it would mean if you were propose a new regulation for cars. We did not grow up with software. We did not grow up with Facebook. And now we did not grow up with AI in the same way. And we're not going to wait 100 years to work out how to do it. But I think a kind of a, kind of a key point to make here is that there's a sort of very common framing where technology people say, oh, technology policy is complicated and it's full of trade-offs and you don't understand. I think that's slightly the wrong way of looking at it. Really, what technology people are saying is, no, technology policy is no easier or simpler than any other kind of policy. It's just as difficult as transport policy or healthcare policy or education policy. And so that takes me finally to talking um, about regulating AI. I think 
there's a sort of a primary problem here, which is to ask, well, what problem is it that we're trying to solve? Are we trying to solve problems of people doing bad things or foolish things with software? And machine learning and now generative machine learning creates new ways that you can do bad things or foolish things with software. Are we worrying about geopolitics and data centers and the dominance of large companies and large economies and whether this important new technology will shut out Europe? Or are we worrying that we're going to produce some intelligent life form that will kill us all? Well, we might worry about all of those things, but those are completely different kinds of problem. And one thing that I want to kind of throw in here, which I think as a British person I'm very conscious of, I'm honestly not sure how many people in the audience are familiar with this. This is a huge scandal in the UK in which the post office deployed a new computer system that had bugs that showed shortfalls of cash. And the post office believed that all of its staff were stealing and ignored the bugs and went to court and claimed that there were no bugs. Hundreds of people were prosecuted. A number of people committed suicide. It took 10, almost 15 years for the post office and Fujitsu to admit, no, this is all caused by bugs in the software. This is not artificial intelligence. It's not AI. It's not large language models. This is 1970s technology. And yet this is happening five and 10 years ago. And so each of these new waves of technology creates new ways that this can happen. Um, what happens if people do bad things with software? What happens if people don't understand the software? This creates kind of a new class of problem. Um, and we kind of try and work out, well, yes, but how do we work out the right way of regulating those? You know, we do not have a database regulator who would have stopped this. This is kind of a judicial system problem, but it's but there is no SQL regulator. There is no Oracle regulator who would have prevented this. So a couple of final comments and then we have time for some discussion. Um, we came out of the pandemic. We got very excited about a huge acceleration and then we kind of returned to the trend line. Um, so this is a chart of e-commerce in the USA. Um, it spiked up in the pandemic and then returned exactly back to the trend line. This chart looks much the same for pretty much in every industrialized country. It's just the levels are higher and lower. The UK penetration is a lot higher than this. French penetration is a lot lower. Um, there's an old joke that when the apocalypse comes, you want to live in France because everything happens five years later there. And that does seem to apply to technology, um, for excepting obviously any French people on the call who are all, I'm sure, early adopters. Um, but e-commerce is kind of boring. There's one thing that I wanted to talk about just to illustrate this at a more kind of um, instinctive level, um, that um, we all sort of grew up with software, but I think we kind of forget how important it became. And I think this is a good illustration of that. This is data for online dating in the USA. 50% of new relationships in the USA now start in dating apps. And so what's happened is that software was on computers and technology were always kind of interesting and exciting, but they weren't part of everybody's lives. And now they've become everybody's a part of everybody's life and a basic part of, of, the, of the way that we all live. Um, and that I think changes the way that we think about all of these policies. Um, but as I said earlier, because it's happened so quickly, um, it's harder for us to understand quite what it means. And with that, I will say thank you. And I think that's exactly 20 minutes. So we have time for some discussion. Well, it's hard to comment. I think I have the best job in the world. First, because I get to listen to this. And second, because I don't have to comment, but I can ask uh, Gilles <laughs> to, to build on this. So it's really it's really an honor, Gilles, to have you with us. Uh, I don't know where you want to start, but feel free. Me neither, actually. Uh, but probably the, the, the thing I'd like to start with is um, just a uh, small comment about the fact that uh, I love the way you present in you things, but I think you have a, the subtle English touches uh, of rumors that French are incapable of putting together. You know, it's it's really something I, I love actually. Um, but apart from that, I think you've touched upon many topics which are completely key to this um, this new technology actually. One of which I'm, I'm currently working on, actually, which is the whether this time it's different, you know, because uh, we've been around for like a decade and uh, we saw a lot of uh, new technologies that you mentioned uh, coming. And we um, we were many actually each time to think that this time this is different. For instance, mobile um, made a big difference in the developing world, for instance, uh, and it's it was really something which is uh, 
probably a game changer in many aspects. And um, the, the real question is, uh, is this even more uh, different than, than before? I am tempted to, to believe in that. Um, and, and, you know, for, for probably a few reasons. Um, the first is that if you look at the narratives that came through uh, science fiction, there are two essential things. One was uh, easiness of communication, which was brought by TIP, and AI. You would find those two in most, a lot of big uh, AI movies like blockbusters and so on. And, and here we are, we have those two together. And I think it's, it's a game changer because you can address a lot of, I would say, human problems uh, in a way that was almost untouched by the technology until recently. So it's, it's the beginning. It's probably based on the discussion I'm having with the, the experts of, of the industry. It's not slowing, it's mostly accelerating. And uh, a lot of um, people were quite skeptical about uh, the game changing aspect of the technology are uh, now saying that this time it could be diff different. I'm, I'm thinking, or, or, or I don't know um, what would, uh, for instance, um, um, Robert Gordon, you know, he's one of the most famous economics in the world, he's a Nobel Prize. He was among the few who said, he, he said this famous quote, I can see computers I, everywhere. I'm just spreading me a lot. Okay. Or so some of them, I know them, they want my response. I could Go ahead, go ahead. There was, a, there was a... Okay, great. So he said, I can see computers everywhere, but in uh, economic statistics. Uh, and now he's saying it might be a game changer. You know, it might be. And so this is a key thing. I, I believe that we might have something which is changing the, the, the productivity gain overall which would mean that it would be completely disturbing the way the, the, the society as we know it works. And, uh, and therefore, I would say the couple in between innovators and regulators is uh, more crucial um, than ever. You know, if you do it in, in the right way, you can organize the reskilling of people and you, make the, you organize the ship so that it's not too harsh to people. But if you don't prepare, if you don't, I would say, see it coming, it could be quite difficult to manage uh, on social terms uh, in general. So this is one thing I believe is, uh, is key. And um, the other thing that I think is interesting is uh, the notion of um, the evolution of the law, the regulation. The more I can see it, I believe that it's, it's becoming uh, this notion of a code as law um, that most of it in, us in the tech field uh, are aware of. I think that we're going to have a lot of soft law everywhere, if not our law. For instance, I don't know if the audience is familiar with the notion of pre-prompt, but every time you prompt uh, chat GPT, you have an invisible pre-prompt, which I would say censor the, 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 the answer. You know, for instance, it says that the Dalai Lama is not a political leader, but a spiritual leader. And should the answer involve the notion of Dalai Lama, it has to be stated that way. You know, and you have plenty, pre has been uh, revealed by some, some smart hackers. Uh, you, you find tons of rules, like moral rules, political rules, and so on, that uh, the, the the machine shouldn't shouldn't cross, and um, I, I think it's it's kind of invisible laws that are more and more common. Um, on the long run, we can see this in in cars, uh, in media's, in in a lot of stuff um, that will come around as well, and and we need to define how how we want to work with this. You know, so that's also something that you you've touched upon. And I think it's really, uh, really interesting. And, and the last thing which I, you know, I'd like to, to raise, and you spoke about a little bit as well, it's, it's the notion of uh, risk factors. You know that there is a controversy nowadays in between uh, Joshua Benjo, Jeffrey Hinton, 
Jan Lequin and a few others, some are basically saying, this is just great. And we have been waiting for this uh, since like ever. And the others are saying uh, it might be great, but it could be also the end of the of 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 the human civilization. Um, and I think it's it's quite interesting because it's it's uh, I don't know what's the answer. Uh, my personal answer is that it's more positive than negative. But I would suspect that this kind of answers, um, the differences between those two camps, uh, is uh, a good signal that there is uh, something big uh, happening, you know, whether it's, uh, I don't mean AGI or whatever, I just mean that it's, it's probably bigger than what we had until recently. And I would end my remarks on, on this. I, I haven't seen in the past that many um, fundraise on one specific sector, which is AI. Uh, we had probably thousands of startup finance in the AI field uh, over the past two years. Uh, nothing that we have seen comparable before. And just for that reason, I, I don't see it uh, slowing. And, and therefore, more than ever, uh, we need to try to foresee the future, um, gather the technologists and the regulators and make sure that we can plan it for the greater good. Thanks, Gilles. Thanks for this inspiring world. Uh, I, please uh, uh, let everyone know that you can, anyone can uh, uh, raise a hand or intervene in the chat. Uh, ben, do you want to reply to this before we move yes. on to the to the so, full discussion? You only gave me twenty minutes um, to present. <laughs> I um, we actually wrote something sort of two months ago, months so six weeks ago about sort of productivity and employment. So talking about lump of labor fallacy and the Jevons paradox and sort of acceleration and change around this. Um, I think. In some senses, sort of, in some senses, most or all questions about generative AI start by saying, is this just another platform shift? Is this just like all of the other platform shifts? Or is this something fundamentally different? Because if it is just like all the other platform shifts, then all these questions like, well, what does it mean for employment? What does it mean for you know, competition? What does it mean for big companies? Will there be startups? then all the answers to that kind of flow logically out of that, because you, you know what happened with competition and startups on the cloud or with SaaS or with the last wave of machine learning or with smartphones. Um, if it's not, then this all looks very different. Um, I think the challenge with talking about this is, um, I think all arguments about sort of, sort of another sort of Twitter-like framing, all arguments about AGI or acceleration or superintelligence seem to me be to be sort of hunts for metaphors. So people will say, well, it's like a meteorite, or it's like nuclear weapons, or it's like electricity, or it's like this, because you know what that is. You know you understand what nuclear weapons are. We understand how we think about them. The, the challenge here, I think, is, um, and I'll sort of see if this is if, how this works, is that you know, so my metaphor is, like, we don't have any theoretical model of what our own intelligence is. We don't really have a theoretical model of what AGI would be. We don't have a theoretical model of how LMs work either. And so it's a little bit, you know, to choose a flawed but useful metaphor. It's as though we were looking at the Apollo, the Apollo program and wondering whether it would go to the moon when we had no theory of gravity and no theory of orbital mechanics. So we would say, well, these rockets seem to be going higher and the moon seems to be that direction. But we don't really know how far away the moon is or what it is or how gravity works. Um, now, this is not a perfect analogy in any way, but I think it does speak to the challenge that we have understanding how we think about this sort of primal existential risk. Because some people look at this and say, well, if you don't know, you should be terrified. And other people look at this and say, if you have no basis to know whether you should be worried, why were we even talking about this? Um, this is why people talk about Pascal's wager, for example. Suddenly, everybody remembers their undergraduate philosophy course. Um, so we have Anselm's ontological proof, and we have Pascal's wager, and people start talking about Descartes. And 
it's a challenge because we don't really know. And so you have some people who spend 20 years studying this saying, I'm worried, and other people who spend 20 years studying this saying, I'm not worried. And then you get people arguing from authority. And it's a difficult thing to work out how to even know what you think, let alone regulate, because you don't really know what it is. Um, I'll kind of I'll kind of stop there, but that's kind of I think that's what sits beneath an awful lot of discussions about AI risk. It's really how do you think about a risk that you can't measure and have no theoretical model of that might be real, but you don't really know. I think there's a joke about a philosopher who kills himself to see what happens, and his colleague says that's like skipping to the end of a novel to to, to find out the ending. Thanks. That's great. Listen, uh, we are already close to the finish, so I want to open up the discussion. I don't. I see, for instance, uh, it's very important to know how business look at this. And uh, Ben Butters, of the president of Eurosham, is here with us. Uh, would you like to intervene, Ben? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there, David. Thanks. Yeah. Um... Thank you very much, Benedict, for the for the for the presentation. I, I I didn't have a question particularly, but I just wanted to 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 point out that we often focus on how AI is being regulated, but increasingly it seems that AI is being used by regulators um, to, to to try and fine tune their their approach. And 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 the Commission last week in its annual work program, in fact, announced that they will be uh, developing AI tools. Um, uh, as a way of trying to reduce reporting requirements on, on businesses, which is something that they've been wrestling with for years. So uh, just to say that there's uh, two sides to this coin in, in terms of the regulatory aspect of AI as well. I'll leave it there, David. Thank you very much. And actually, I want to add on this, and you don't have to answer this directly, Ben or Jill, but uh, there is a question of do how do we equip government with the right skills to not only to design the regulation, but to actually implement. Is it possible? What are the, how how do we do that? Uh, and for instance, to use the technology to regulate. But I don't. I'm not going back to you uh, directly. I want to collect a few other questions. I see that, for instance, uh, Leo Kilroy is there from the permanent representation of uh, of Ireland. Leo, can you hear us? We don't hear you. OK, while while we uh, there seems to be a problem with your microphones, Leo, while you try to sort it out, uh, I wanted to hear a bit from the developer side. Karina, uh, Karina uh, Nimara from uh, Developers Association. Yes. Hi, uh, welcome. Hi, thank you. How do you see all yes. this? It's a great opportunity, well, I was but also I listen, think, yeah, this? listening, uh, listening to, to certain uh, uh, remarks. I was uh, just thinking because we see the practical side of it. So, uh, you know, the EU already decided to take the approach of a product safety regulation and moreover uh, horizontal mm -hmm. product safety regulation and there are a lot of uh, requirements for example now in the discussion in the negotiations we hear about requirements about uh, um, uh, human rights and, and rule of law conformity assessments or environmental impact and uh, all of uh, of these requirements for for compliance will be have to be translated into technical standards so we are more preoccupied with the with these aspects and also with with the question general question how competitive will be the EUC marked AI on the uh, on a global market um, and uh, I would I would also uh, like to hear uh, Benedict's um, opinion about the the latest approach taken by by the EU policymakers on on having a, the sort of DSA DMA approach, uh, tiered approach, for example, of having a, a, a more rigid approach, you know, uh, more requirements for a very capable foundation models. And I don't know if it's uh, strictly linked to the risk approach, but also it, it, it has uh, uh, like um, competition, for example, uh, um, a competition policy aspect, or I don't know, uh, 
I would like to hear. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. That. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Karina. Uh, I, 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 ben, can you allow me to gather just two more so that we manage to wrap it up in time? Thanks. Um, I see from, uh, let's say, from the uh, industry side, also Wim de Waal is here with us. Wim has a great uh, experience in with the startups in Belgium, AI startups and not only. Wim, do you want to intervene? Yeah, thank you very much for uh, getting the opportunity and thank you, Benedict, for an interesting, very interesting talk. I wanted to pick up uh, um, a bit on your um, your observation about unbundling, whether we are dealing with a, a general purpose technology and a couple of platforms will dominate everything, which I probably think is true and unfortunately probably won't be Europeans uh, given our the economic dynamics. but. It, couldn't we describe those rather as platforms? And will you see startups kind of unbundle the software? And that's where we as investors now see the opportunity uh, uh, and, in, and the emerging market, so to speak. Uh, and as such, um, I think uh, there is also an opportunity for Europe and com competitive law or regulation will probably not undermine that, in my opinion. Thanks, thanks. Let's just get the last point from Douglas Heinzman, who raised his hand, and then we move back to the speakers. Douglas. Hi, uh, thanks very much. Um, hi, Benedict. Uh, one of the areas that I've, I'm really kind of curious about is when the technology kind of backside runs into innovation on the front side. So, you know, with with mobile devices or with these new glasses that various different vendors are coming up with, the potential of having contextual advice being part of our our day to day life, especially when paired with domain specific uh, training, such as in pharmaceuticals or in financial advisories, how do you think that the ability to have con highly contextualized, pervasive always on advice about what's going on and what questions should be asked. Thanks. So let's go back to our speakers. Ben, a lot of questions, sorry. So, so, so several things within this. Um, I mean, the sort of kind of question about, does this become one giant model or does this work out like the last platform shift? So what, with what happened with cloud or the last wave of machine learning is, well, the storage is on the hyperscaler and the data processing is on Azure and the image recognition is on GCP and you use Google's translation, but you build your own. And so there's not an opportunity to build a startup that's doing data storage. Um, but there's 100,000 startups that are enabled because you have cheap commodity data storage from the, from the hyperscalers. And so as you go further up the stack, you have you know, many more companies that are using those low level commodity components. So back in the last wave of machine learning at Andreessen Horowitz, like you would see a company that says we're going to be an image recognition platform. Well, that's image, that's not a product that Boeing or Tesco can buy. Image recognition becomes a component on a hyperscaler, and then someone builds a product that Boeing can buy that happens to be using hyperscale components low, low down within the product, but that's not what the product is. And so that's sort of the default view of how this will play out that, you know, things where there are enormous economies of scale, those will be big, like that will be one kind of company, and things where it's all about how you turn that into product and build a go-to-market and the sales force, that will be another kind of product. That's how SaaS worked and cloud worked and indeed how mobile worked. You know, we have an iPhone and then we have 50 apps on the iPhone and most of them aren't from Apple or Google. Um, the counter argument is to say, no, this will be different, that, um, there will be a small number of very large, very powerful, very expensive to build models that are very capable and they go much further up the stack. And so everything else is a sort of a very thin layer on top. This is a phrase in the industry is like a thin chat GPT wrapper because you're just wrapping chat GPT in a very kind of thin layer of your own. Um, I sort of it occurred to me to call this is like the Velt computer thesis. There's like three Velt computers, three world computers and everything else kind of plugs onto, to, on, onto that. Um, it seems unlikely, deterministically. I don't think anyone knows, but it does kind of come from this like foundational question, like is this the same as every other platform shift or will this be completely different? 
And I don't think we have like a good a priori reason to believe this is going to be different. Like it might be, um, but I don't think we know that yet. Um, but out of that, many questions come. And of course, the challenge for a regulator, and this is a problem we see for regulation of tech in many other fields, is do you wait until it's all clear by which point it's too late? Or do you speculate about what might happen, in which case you've got like a 75% chance of being completely wrong about what's going to happen? You know, this is something the competition regulators and wrestle with a great deal. Like, there's not a right answer to that question. Um, I think the challenge here is, you know, it, it, it kind of compounds that. It's changing so fast, it's much harder to know what a good law would be. Um, and, you know, I think Jan LeCun has said this is kind of like looking at aircraft in 1905 and saying, right, we need a standardization process. We need pan-European rules on how aircraft can get built. We need to define what they are. We'll define the following four kinds of aircraft. And like, and you've immediately, you've basically blocked everything that's going to happen in the next 10 years. You said, well, aircraft can either use canvas or they can use silk. OK, so aluminium aircraft are now illegal because it had nobody has thought of that yet. And so you've got kind of a real challenge in trying to get too prescriptive on something too early. But you also have a challenge in waiting. Thanks. <laughs> Gilles? Yeah, maybe just a few words because I think that uh, Ben um, addressed uh, very well most mm -hmm. of the points. But um, uh, Wim, uh, the, the key point probably for EU now is um, to try to define a, a, a road that is probably different from the one we saw recently uh, in, in the US. Uh, we won't make any form of comeback by just copying what was done over there. Um, but one of the few things which I believe is interesting is that um, I would say the 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 the, re, um, the new interest for open source, um, gathering communities, um, building um, kind of a group of interest. Um, is a way to probably uh, build something different. Something which I believe is quite interesting is what is, is uh, ongoing currently in India, where they are um, really built some interesting counter forces. For instance, UPI, it's a universal payment system uh, that is crossing the 2 billion payment per day, I believe nowadays. Uh, and it's been completely built out of standardization, it's it's free from any any platform ownership, but it's 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 working full scale. And so that's part of something interesting. And, and to do glass, I believe that um, it's it's quite interesting because if you look at the different faces of the internet, um, the architectures they have changed drastically. You had mainframe, very concentrated data, um, microcomputer, very decentralized, then cloud, very centralized, then an attempt of what we would call a web three, completely decentralized. And now we have a new form of, of uh, what I would call edge computing with centralized large models and probably like um, AI companion that would be more uh, into your phone and not the same architecture than the one that would be centralized. So there is a, a, a platform shift, and I believe it's it's time for a, new opportunities, for new players. Those who will understand the sense of the architecture might take a very strong leadership in there. Thanks a Thank lot. You. I heard the voice. I didn't see who's speaking. Look, we are uh, wrapping up. Uh, before I close, I would like to ask the speakers for some final thoughts to leave us with, taking into account that this is an important week. We are in another trilogue discussing uh, rules, standards, definitions, exemption thresholds. Do you have a final message to leave us with? And uh, how do we move forward this discussion? You mean a message for the, the, the people who are into the trilogue? We are all into the trilogue somehow, or represented uh, in, uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, my message would be, uh, you know, let the innovator um, define the, the way and then, you know, don't be too, too strong in regulation. 
Benedict? Yeah, I, I call back to a comment I made almost in passing in my presentation. I would be very hesitant about talking about AI. I would talk about sort of specific technologies and specific kinds of problems. What is it exactly that you're trying to solve? And feel that that could be four or five quite different and maybe quite unrelated things. It's very tempting to set an agenda and say we are exercising leadership in the regulation of AI. Um, but, you know, today when you use your phone, there's 50 different things happening that were AI 10 years ago. And now that's just software. We don't have a law that covers the camera in your phone and how quickly your Uber gets dispatched to you. But that's all using machine learning. And so I'm sort of nervous in principle about the idea of regulating AI as one thing. Wow. Well, thanks, everyone. Listen, from my side, I learned a lot. I also, you know, somehow realized the old uh, Greek saying that uh, wisdom is knowing that you don't know. We realize that we don't know a lot. We realize that uh, we don't have even the definitions and the words to define what we are talking about. We don't have the prop. We don't have a clear view of the problems and the risk they entails. And there is a kind of consensus here that one year from now, there will be as large a change as we had it in the past year, if not bigger. So it's clearly a, a call for for humility, which means also a call for um, a regulation which is not over prescriptive, as as uh, speakers before were saying, that does not hinder regulate, that does not hinder innovation, does not block what's going to come, what the innovators are going to build in Europe. And I think it, it's uh, we don't have a, clearly a solution, we don't have a direct input into the negotiation, but I think the general concept is very powerful, and I think the best way to move forward is to keep on discussing and having open discussion as uh, this one with all the actors in the involved, including policymakers that were here present today. And uh, I think learning is the best we can do at the moment. So I want to thank all the speakers and all the participants for staying with us until the end. We, you know, we really want to finish on time. Uh, we could on, go on forever, but we will leave it for the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.